All right, welcome to the uh, first afternoon session of the uh, technical deep dive track. We had a couple of slightly lighter talks to kick off the track, and now it's getting really deeply technical. Please let me uh, introduce to you Peter Feiner, computer scientist from uh, Grid Centric, and uh, his talk is Scaling the Boot Barrier, Identifying and Eliminating Contention in OpenStack. Please welcome Peter. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to see you all here attending my talk and at the OpenStack Summit. So I'm Peter, I work for GridCentric, and we're a uh, hypervisor optimization company, and our product works with OpenStack. So what we really care about is the end-to-end -end performance. Uh, so this talk is about uh, one component of that performance, which is the VM creation in OpenStack. So deploying uh, applications as virtual machines has a couple of clear advantages. Uh, first of all, it lets you carve up a, a big host, uh, and it makes your application capacity granular. So if you have a, a giant host, and you might decide to divide that up into 100 units of work, you can, uh, you can run in those units of work virtual machines, and these can be virtual machines serving capacity for uh, totally unrelated applications. Uh, so this is great. And with this model, you simply increase capacity by creating more uh, virtual machines. So nothing new here. Uh, so as your load increases your capacity, at some point you need more VMs to, to handle what's going on. So the question you ask is, when should you create more uh, virtual machines? So you want to do it as late as possible. Say you're running a, uh, a public cloud, excuse me, say you're a customer of a public cloud uh, and you're cheap, you want to pay as little as possible to, uh, to run your service. So you want to avoid over-provisioning. And of course, uh, the same argument holds for a private cloud. You, uh, you, know, you want to have as much capacity to run other applications, uh, so you don't want to waste it uh, by over-provisioning. But you have a conflicting interest. You also want to run these virtual machines as soon as necessary. That is, when the, when the capacity uh, starts to reach your load, you don't want the new virtual machines to come up too late so that the, the new requests or whatever work these things are handling uh, gets delayed. So to solve this problem, you need to anticipate when the load will surpass the capacity. This in and of itself is a, is a complicated problem, or I should say it's an open problem, uh, and I'm not going to be talking about that today. The second part, though, is once you've modeled your, your capacity, uh, you need to factor into the, the VM creation decision how long it takes for a new virtual machine to actually start serving. Uh, and the question that I'm going to explore is, how can we optimize this? That is, how can we make new virtual machines come up quickly once you've decided to create them? So there are two distinct phases in the, uh, the creation of a virtual machine, uh, really with any virtualization stack. But of course, we're talking about OpenStack. There's what I'm calling the VM creation time. Uh, and then we sum that with the guest preparation time. So by VM creation time, I mean the time it takes from when you type in Nova Boot until the time it shows on your dashboard or the status or whatever that the virtual machine is active. And this is a significant event because it means that the, uh, the virtual machine has actually started running and it's emulating the, the guest BIOS and then the, you know, the guest is booting and so forth. So the second part is the guest preparation time. So this is once the virtual machine's actually started running. Uh, so with QMU KVM, there's a QMU process and it's churning through uh, guest instructions or, you know, the However, that's handled on the back end. And so now we're looking at the time for the operating system to boot and the application to actually start and start serving requests. So if you have a lean operating system, like uh, for example, Ubuntu's uh, enterprise cloud server Linux, it's really fast. It'll boot in a few seconds. And then if you have a stateless application, say some web server that connects to a, uh, a database running elsewhere, you can be up and running in less than 10 seconds and serving requests. Or if you have a fat operating system, say Windows, uh, and you have a big application, for example, you wouldn't run this on Windows, say you're running Linux and you have like a big J2E application where before it starts serving stuff, lean and mean, it's got to do a bunch of JIT and maybe it needs to compute some uh, indexes and this can take an arbitrary amount of time, obviously. Uh, now, if you want this to be ready instantly, you can use GridCentric's product, Live Images, uh, but this is something also that I'm not going to be talking about. But if you'd like to know more, come see our booth in the exhibitor hall. What I want to talk about is the VM creation time. Uh, that is how long it takes for the, the virtual machine to actually exist. 
And it turns out that this can take a long time. Uh, and so what uh, I'm going to do for the rest of this talk is do an experiment and then we'll explore the results and look at some techniques for improving the VM creation time. So let's start with the experimental setup. What we're going to be measuring is the time it takes to create virtual machines in parallel. Uh, so we will make n creation requests in parallel. That is, we'll hit the API server with n requests. Uh, and then we're going to measure the time from the API request to uh, the vir virtual machines being active. Uh, the platform we're running on is Grizzly. And the compute backend we're using is libvirt plus KVM. We're using uh, networking quantum with open vSwitch, and the storage backend is QCOW2. Now, it's good. Uh, I should point out I'm giving the details of the, the setup for two reasons. One is that it's nice to know the results for the latest and greatest and see all the progress that's been made uh, over the years in OpenStack. But the other thing is that these results only apply to this particular setup. Uh, that is, the other, uh, other components of OpenStack or other drivers for these various OpenStack components have different performance characteristics. Uh, nonetheless, the techniques I'm presenting can be used to analyze other uh, OpenStack configurations. And obviously, I chose this setup, or at least some components of this setup, because this is the, uh, the speediest for what I'm measuring. And the system, this is all running on. So it's a single compute host uh, where everything's running. All the networking is local. It has 96 gigabytes of RAM, uh, 12 cores, which are hyper-threaded. There are two hyper-threads per core. There are 24 logical processors and it has uh, solid state drives. Okay, so let's look at the VM creation time. When we create one virtual machine on this setup, it's pretty quick. It takes uh, less than 10 seconds. That's really good, okay? Uh, but the problem is that as we create more virtual machines in parallel, so we're running different experiments, say we create five in parallel, it takes 30 seconds. 10 in parallel, we're looking at about 35, 40 seconds and so forth. So this doesn't look very good. Creating many virtual machines in parallel can be slow. Uh, and the problem with this, of course, is that say we're, we're, we're implementing that virtual machine as application uh, paradigm that I described earlier, your, um, it, th th this, limits the, uh, this limits your ability to, to scale. Because if you want to scale a bunch or if you want to you know, you respond to a, a big peak in load, uh, that will take a long time. Or you've got to increase your granularity, which will uh, which could be poor utilization. So as we see, the the scaling, uh, excuse me, the the creation time increases uh, roughly linearly with the number of VMs we're creating in parallel. Uh, so clearly, there are some bottlenecks. Uh, but one positive note is that this graph looks quite a bit worse without quantum. Uh, when I started doing these experiments, it was with uh, with Folsom and with the Linux bridging Nova network uh, driver and setup and so forth. And the, the curve would have been shifted vertically by about uh, 10 seconds. So later on, I'll, I'll give some details as to why quantum made this a little better. But uh, yeah. OK, so all we know is that the virtual machines are being created uh, in parallel. And it's taking the, the amount of time it takes is roughly linear in the number of virtual machines. Um, so we think there's a bottleneck, i.e., things are lining up to be created. So one takes five seconds, two takes 10 seconds, and so forth. So one thing that we could be waiting for is hardware. That is, if the, the CPUs are pegged, or if we're at a RAM, or the disk is totally tapped, uh, then of course we're not going to be able to create more virtual machines in parallel, because we don't have the, we don't have the cycles to do it. Uh, another uh, broad category of possible bottlenecks are uh, software bottlenecks. Uh, so for example, are locks held for a long time? And are these introducing serialization across all of the, the virtual machine creation? The first thing we're going to look at is hardware. Uh, it's much, much easier to, to analyze hardware bottlenecks and to see if they're, they're present or not. And so we're going to quickly go through uh, my favorite tool for doing this called ATOP. So let's take a look at ATOP. So ATOP, as you could probably guess, fits in the family of top tools like uh, TOP, IOTOP, NETTOP. I'm sure there are a dozen other ones. This one is my favorite. The reason is, first of all, it's got a really sweet uh, curses GUI, and you can you know, manipulate it. But the second thing is that it comprises all of the, excuse me, it includes all of the, the, the measurements and statistics from most of the other top tools. And it breaks these statistics down uh, by uh, system-wide uh, statistics and per process statistics. And you can also do it per, per thread statistics. 
So the, the statistics we're going to be looking at uh, are the, the most straightforward system-wide metrics, and that is the uh, CPU utilization. So on this system, there are 24 logical processors, and it's not doing uh, anything when I took this screenshot. So it's idle 2,400% uh, of the time. That is 24 times 100. So clearly there are some you know, accounting errors because we have uh, one free percent here. So you can't complain about that. Uh, then we have the memory. So on this machine, there's 64 gigs of RAM, and right now free is 58.5 gigs. So really not a whole lot going on. And then finally, the disk is uh, busy 1% of the time. Okay, so the question is, are we seeing this, uh, this apparent serialization of virtual machine creation due to hardware contention? So to answer this question, what we're going to do is repeat the experiment, but sample every two seconds the uh, hardware metrics using ATOP. So it's a very simple command, ATOP-W log, it's gonna output to that log file in two seconds. Every two seconds, periodically, it will output the statistics. And we're gonna look at the hardware utilization for the uh, furthest point on the curve, which was N uh, equals 20 VMs being booted in parallel. So, uh, I think it's important <coughs> Excuse me, I think it's important to be precise about exactly what we're measuring, just so we're on the same page here. So we're looking at the RAM, CPU, and disk. And now what exactly it means to measure these things every two seconds. Uh, the RAM, what we're, the, the, the number that you'll get is the amount of RAM at that two second interval that happens to be uh, used. The CPU, on the other hand, would be reported, say you see 50% CPU, 60% CPU. That means that 60% of the time the, the, the processor, the sum of the processors, is not in the idle loop. And similarly for the disk, uh, the percentage time busy is how much of the time it's actually doing something over that two second interval. So at any instant that a CPU is doing something, like the instantaneous measurement would be 100% utilization. But so you, you can't take instantaneous measurements. You need to sample over, uh, or you need to collect the statistics over a period to get a, to get a, a meaningful idea. Okay, so uh, what we've reported here are the median and uh, maximum values for these statistics. So starting with the RAM, we basically see that we're just not using very much of it. So it's clearly not a intended resource. The CPU, uh, the median utilization is 14%, and the maximum is 55%. So most of the time, uh, most CPUs aren't doing anything, and even at the peak, we're not hitting 100% utilization. We're not even close. Similarly with the disk, the, uh, the median is nine, so often uh, very little is being done or nothing's being done. And at the, the highest, or two second interval, we still have 20% uh, of the time where the disk is sitting idle. So it's really important to, to look at these statistics because we could have some notions that say, oh, booting virtual machines, the disk is obviously the, that's what's getting hammered as, the, as those VMs are starting up, or perhaps, um, you know, we've run out of memory because we're creating so many virtual machines and they use a lot of RAM. You can, uh, you can check these, these notions and do a sanity check by looking at hardware uh, utilization metrics. And so right here, uh, it's very plain that there's lots of capacity for parallelism. So the answer must lie elsewhere. So it's time to start looking at uh, potential software bottlenecks. Okay, so first of all, what do I mean by a software bottleneck? I'm gonna define it very broadly as something that inhibits uh, parallelism across this collection of processes. Uh, and it's usually some kind of lock contention. If you're looking at a lower level uh, performance details, i.e. on a sm smaller time scale, then uh, there can be some stuff that's not explicitly in your software, like microarchitectural interaction that can cause contention. But uh, since we're looking at things that take dozens of seconds, uh, it's going to be something in our software. Hopefully, once we identify the software contention, it'll just be easy, uh, it will be easy to fix. Unlike, say, if there were hardware contention where we could just uh, throw more hardware at the problem or buy a faster disk or something, we can't buy faster code. Uh, so hopefully, we'll just identify it and come up with some way of fixing it. And luckily for us, we have textbooks full of uh, different locking strategies, you know, like Reader Writer, RCU, and so forth, and we'll just find the right tool for the job. And the technique we're gonna to use to identify the bottlenecks is uh, tracing. So I wanna take a look at uh, what tracing is exactly. Tracing involves running uh, an application, but uh, during, the, during the run of the application, you record events 
uh, during the execution. For example, function uh, entry and exit or lock acquisition. And an event comprises the, the name of the event and um, the, the time at which it happened. It's pretty straightforward. And what you can do with these, uh, the sequence of events is visualize them as a, as a, a stack of the, the extent of the, the beginning and ending pairs of events. Uh, so for example, I've made, uh, did this by hand, so these timings don't reflect any actual system. This is a trace of a stir dupe, uh, an implementation of stir dupe in the standard C library. So for example, uh, stir dupe takes about six microseconds to run, uh, and while stir dupe is running, it calls three functions. Stir len to see how long the string is that we're gonna duplicate, malloc to allocate the return buffer, and then mem copy, which will copy from the original string to the uh, return buffer. So this is a fairly intuitive and straightforward format. So we see the, which functions were called, and uh, in essence, we also see the dynamic call graph, because you just go from left to right, and you know, as you go deeper, we see which functions are called and when. These, uh, these events are always recorded, or uh, in the setup we have here, they're recorded per thread. So you'll see uh, a call graph like this, or a series of extents per thread. Uh, most traces uh, for anything worth measuring are gonna be a lot nastier and bigger and hairier. Uh, so we'll start looking at some of those. Okay, so how do we go about tracing OpenStack? What we did was added uh, some trace decorators to Nova and Quantum. Uh, and this was just guided by our intuition. We thought, what's taking a lot of time? It's probably something to do with uh, computing and networking. Uh, and uh, these events, uh, excuse me, this decorator would, uh, it emits events on function call and return and before and after uh, lock acquisition. And it outputs to the trace viewer format. Uh, this is a format that Google uses in their uh, Chrome web browser and uh, Android operating system for analyzing performance. And if you're using Google Chrome, you can just type about tracing into the address bar. Do it after the presentation though, so you can keep paying attention. Uh, and you'll get to play around with the trace viewer. So what you do is you sprinkle around some, uh, some trace points in your application, and then you repeat your experiments, and you hunt uh, around the tracing results and look for bottlenecks. And basically what you do is you look for bars that were uh, for n equals one or n equals five that are short, and then those bars that get really wide on n equals 20, we know that that's where the, the problems are. Okay, so uh, the first thing we're gonna do is just start hunting around uh, some of these traces. It's too small to read, but what I have on the top of the screen here is the trace from n equals five, uh, and it takes about 20 seconds to, to create one of the virtual machines. So this is a trace from one of the requests going through the stack. And I'm only showing here the, uh, the events that happened in the Nova Compute threads. There, there'd be thread, there are about a dozen other timelines for threads that happen in the other uh, processes, but they, there's not a whole lot going on in those. And on the bottom, we have the trace for the, uh, the longest n equals 20 uh, VM creation. So we see uh, it's a lot wider at uh, almost 100 seconds. But the one thing to note is that these traces, see if I can get them both on the screen, basically have the same shape. And visually, you can just sort of see the, the pattern of the colors. Uh, each color corresponds to a, uh, a function. And we see that the same thing's happening. We just have like a bunch of pointy things here, and then there's a wide thingy here, and then some more pointy things, and then we're done. The same thing happens here, but it's kind of stretched out. So we have the pointy things, and then that takes a little bit longer. Then we have the wide part with this nice stack of colors, and then some more pointy stuff, and then we're done. Okay. So, now we're gonna use our uh, intuition to guide the, uh, the analysis of uh, these traces. So, what was the first thing that we said that could, uh, the, the first thing to look at for software contention? It's locks. And sure enough, just looking at this screen, I'm gonna zoom in for you guys. Blam. Uh, there's a lock here, can you read that? Yeah. Lock here, and we see this color, I don't know what you'd call this color, but this olivish grayish color is repeated in a few spots. And it turns out that that's the same lock, um, and it's being acquired 
for about 25 seconds here. And these extents don't measure how long the lock is held for. It measures how long the thread is blocking, waiting to hold the lock, okay? So that is clearly a highly contended lock because it's adding, uh, uh, it's, we could have booted, uh, you know, five VMs at the same time, or one of those five in the same time that we just wait holding the lock in the n equals 20 case. Okay, so let's just bring up the detailed view here, click on it. And this is the compute resources lock in, uh, in Nova Compute. All right, so we started our investigation. So what is this compute resources lock and what can we do about it? So we just hunted around uh, and we found this resource accounting lock. So in Nova Compute, resource accounting is pretty straightforward. Uh, it just keeps track, of, these are statistics that keep track of uh, how much RAM, the number of vCPUs, et cetera, that this uh, compute node is using. And uh, you use this to enforce things like quota and to provide nice statistics on the dashboard and so forth. These statistics are maintained sensibly with a global lock, so that way if you have two VMs being created at the same time, we're not trying to increment this, uh, any of these counters racially. The problem is that uh, this lock is adding about 15 seconds to the serialization uh, of creating virtual machines. Now the reason why this lock is held for such a long time uh, isn't because we're just, so the, the, a lock in and of itself isn't, uh, isn't problematic until it gets really fat. And this lock, oh, this lock gets wide This lock gets really wide, um, not because of doing the arithmetic and maintaining the statistics, that, that wouldn't take any time on this time scale that we're looking at, uh, but it's because of the uh, uh, new component added in Grizzly, which is Conductor, which is basically this service that uh, does the actual database writes, and Nova Compute, while it has this lock, is transmitting the statistics to Conductor via RPC. So these RPCs are pretty quick, they can take a, a couple of milliseconds or 100 milliseconds, but when you're doing 20 of these at the same time uh, and everybody's lining up and sometimes you're doing a bunch of these in sequence while you have this lock, 20 times 200 milliseconds adds up. Um, so how can, we, how can we deal with this? We want the conductor uh, because that, you know, there, there were solid design decisions or reasons for, for introducing that. And we clearly want to maintain these statistics properly so we still need this lock. So we can't just get rid of it. Uh, that would be... That would be great, but we can't. Uh, so the solution we took to this problem uh, comes in two parts. The first part of the solution was to just to look at this code and see that a lot of the time when this lock is held and these statistics are updated and the new statistics are transmitted to conductor, uh, they're not actually changing. So it turns out that in Nova Compute, every time instance update is called, say you're changing something like the, the title of the instance or you're, you know, you're changing what networks are associated with this instance or something, um, the whole shebang is sent to conductor. So uh, what you can do is while you have the lock acquired, you can just check the delta of the statistics to see if uh, anything actually needs to be sent to conductor. Uh, and if you do this, then you avoid most of the, you avoid most of the, the time that you hold the lock and uh, you solve this problem in a lot of cases. And so the net result is that the median creation time is reduced by about 10% when you create uh, 20 virtual machines in parallel. So that's great. Um, second part of the solution, which I haven't done yet, uh, but it'll also be great, is to coalesce the RPCs that do need to be sent to uh, conductor. So say you have three statistic update RPCs that are waiting to be sent, they're waiting for this lock. You could, uh, you, you, right before you send those, uh, right before you send those new statistics, you could just compute the, the sum of those three statistics and send conductor one RPC. So let's see what the, uh, the trace looks like with, the, uh, with this improvement. So before we had all of these locks, one, two, three, four, and there's some more that you can't see, they're too small. Um, then after doing this uh, change, now it's only apparent that two of these resource compute locks are taking a bunch of time. Uh, the rest of them, they're still there, but they're just a lot shorter because we don't need to send RPCs, so we don't need to uh, 
we hold the lock for a very short amount of time. So that's cool. Uh, and if we were to do the, the coalescing, then these two uh, RPCs, uh, excuse me, these two, the period, the, the amount of time at which, for the, which this lock is held would decrease in these other cases. Because we can see it's still held for uh, 4.5 seconds, uh, which is a significant amount of time compared to the, like, the amount of time it creates, it takes to create a virtual machine. Okay. Uh, so the next thing we're going to start hunting around for is libvert. Now we know that libvert uh, is important in this setup because libvert is the it's you know one of the lowest levels of the stack beneath it sits QMU and KVM, the emulated devices and so forth. And so what libvert does is it starts the QMU process, it creates the app armor profile for this instance and so forth. So it does a bunch of stuff. And if you're running, uh, if you're booting one virtual machine, uh, libvert will take about three and a half seconds to do everything. But when you're creating a bunch of virtual machines in parallel, uh, it turns out that libvert can take a long time to do its business. And the reason is there's a global lock in libvert for doing anything with uh, doing anything with QMU. Okay, so we know about this global libvert lock. Uh, and we'd love to fix it, but that's, uh, that's going to be the next step. Uh, the people at LibVert are working on that, and I plan to start working on that. But in the meantime, uh, I ask the question, is there anything we can do to mitigate this problem? So let's start hunting again. Okay, so this is where we left off before. Uh, now let's look for the extents where uh, we're taking a long time to do LibVert stuff. Uh, for example, okay, this one makes a lot of sense. This is Virch. Uh, libvert domain, doesn't like me, uh, create with flags. So that's the, that's the meat of actually creating the thing. That takes 12 seconds. Okay, you know, that was a lot longer than before, but we know there's some contention. But then what about all these other libvert calls, like libvert get lib version? Six seconds, that's crazy, right? Or libvert uh, number of domains, 8.239 seconds. Uh, okay, that's also a long time to to do something uh, that might not uh, need to take so long. And then even more troubling, after we've done the important call to create the domain, we still have more libvert calls. In fact, we still have 101 more libvert calls. Uh, so what's going on? You know, are these necessary? Uh, and it's important to, uh, to ask these questions. So we can see here, these are all the libvert calls. I'll explain in a minute why these are happening in a different thread. Uh, but we have all these libvert calls that are happening, and they're taking a long time, uh, and they're happening ostensibly after the virtual machine has been created. Okay. So, uh, it turns out there are many short calls into libvert uh, to get stuff that maybe we don't have to ask libvert about, like the host name. Uh, and these short calls can become long due to the global lock. So the solution, uh, one solution, aside from fixing libvert, is to avoid the unnecessary calls. And it turns out, with a little bit of work, you can uh, reduce the number of calls into libvert from 248 to create a virtual machine uh, to seven. And doing this reduces the maximum virtual machine creation time by 20%. Now, unfortunately, it didn't change the median, uh, the median creation time very much. Uh, and the reason is the, you still have to wait to libvert to do the meet. But uh, some things we're doing one little libvert call on the tail end and the uh, like get libvert version uh, after the virtual machine had already been created and that would, block, uh, that would block the return from that API request. So if we see the result of eliminating those libvert calls, so on the bottom we have the original or the before and on the top we have the after. Uh, now in this libvert calling thread we only have about seven calls. Uh, so that's good. That's an improvement. And we can see this is an example where the maximum uh, time has been decreased by 10 seconds. Okay. All right. The last thing we're going to hunt for is uh, event-lit related problems. Now, show of hands, uh, whose favorite threading library is event-lit? <laughs> okay. So we have some intuition. And whose least favorite threading library is eventlet? Okay. So you're working on this and you're reading about the, uh, uh, you look in the mailing list, people have done uh, 
So they've fixed some performance problems with Nova in the past by uh, dealing with some eventlet related stuff. And they've done good work and it's gotten us uh, a long way. But perhaps there's more we can do. So let's take, a, let's take another look at what's going on. Uh, so for those of you that uh, didn't raise your hand, let's give a little background on Eventlet. So Eventlet is a, uh, it's a cooperative, uh, user-threaded uh, threading implementation where essentially a, a green thread, uh, or one of Eventlet's threads, is really a coroutine. Uh, and so there's a collection of coroutines and they're multiplexed cooperatively onto a single native thread. What I mean by cooperatively is instead of blocking, uh, these threads will just yield to one another when they're gonna make something uh, a system call that would otherwise be blocking. So Python standard library normally just makes proper system calls and they block and Python threads are, um, they're native and so you have, you know, one thread's blocking, the other threads can continue running. But with Eventlet we only have one thread. So Eventlet, uh, to solve this problem, patches the standard library routines in Python that would normally block uh, and it patches them to yield instead of block. Um, but the extent of this patching or the, the comprehensiveness of this patching isn't 100% because uh, you can't patch stuff that's not written in Python, uh, i.e., or for example, say libvert.so uses a send to system call to talk over a socket, uh, you can't patch that. Okay, so to get around this, in the past, open stack developers uh, have used pools of native threads to do blocking libvert calls on behalf of, um, of the green threads. And this is good, this solved uh, big problems but maybe there's more room for improvement. So let's look in the trace to see exactly uh, what's happening. So like I said before, there are all these libvert calls happening in another thread. And this other thread is the, uh, this is the worker thread, and it's a native thread, and these can block. And here is the green thread, so we have this big function call stack through the green thread. And at the bottom, we're doing, uh, say, uh, ver domain, create with flags, and then there's a corresponding function call in the, uh, the native thread to actually do, uh, to communicate with libvert.so. So here we see tpool, which is dispatching to one of the threads, and then here the, the work's happening. Okay, so this, this trace matches the, uh, the, uh, the model, as far as we understand, that's good. But there's an interesting thing happening. Um, I ask for the thread pool to do vert domain create, but it takes seven seconds before it actually calls ver domain create. Uh, so what's going on there? And similarly, uh, define XML, something like 20 seconds, or 17 seconds between the, uh, the dispatching to the thread pool and the thing actually getting called. So this thread pool has 20 threads, uh, and we're doing 20 requests in parallel. So you know maybe we've run out of threads, or maybe we've run out of threads in the thread pool. Uh, that's not the case, I tried increasing it, still saw the same thing. So it turns out that in Eventlet, there's one work queue per worker thread. So say we have 20 native worker threads, there are 20 work queues. And the correspondence between a green thread and a worker queue, uh, that is which, so a green thread A will always submit work to work queue B, uh, this correspondence is fixed. And it's just a function of the green thread's ID. So the worker index is some function, some hash function of the worker's ID, mod the worker count, and then you append the work to that work queue. And so the problem here is that you can have two green threads that, uh, that want work done by a native thread, um, and their hash happens to be the, the same thing. And the probability is actually pretty high because the, you know, it's one in 20 that there will be a collision between two threads. Um, and so that's, that's exactly what we were observing. Two green threads were submitting work to the same uh, work queue, and so the, the, the second thread's work wouldn't start to, to happen until the first thread's work was finished. So the solution is just use a standard, uh, you know, use a global work queue. It's really straightforward, just two line change to eventlet. Uh, but you can see at the bottom of the screen here, unfortunately, all that buys us is waiting on libvert a little bit sooner. So, make a sad face. So let's see what that looks like. So whereas before, say we did uh, create with flags and then there were seven seconds before we were dispatched in the native thread, uh, here we call create with flags and then immediately we're dispatched in the native thread. Um, so 
that's that. But unfortunately, the creation time it wasn't really shifted here. So it was a good attempt. Okay, so we've made a few optimizations. Uh, we've made a few changes, and let's look at the results. So before, this was the original curve, and after, here's the delta. <laughs> Not a big change. You know, this isn't, this isn't my favorite slide. So the VM creation time, uh, the maximum time uh, was uh, reduced by 20%. Uh, and the median time was lowered by 10%. So these aren't infinitesimal. These aren't meaningless savings, but it's still only 10, 20%. This isn't the, uh, this isn't the horizontal line that we had hoped for. Um, and in essence, what these uh, changes let us do is wait for libvert sooner. Although the changes to the, uh, the resource contention lock did, uh, th that's why the, the median was shifted, because we weren't waiting for libvert there. Uh, we were just reducing the total amount of work done. But on the bright side, uh, you've got to understand that you, you basically need to fix all the contention problems before you start seeing the horizontal line. So if libvert had been fixed, uh, this line would have still been uh, nice and linear because there would have been these other contention problems. So once uh, we or somebody else fixes libvert, which ought to be happening soon, OpenStack will have this many fewer bottlenecks and the creation process for this particular setup will hopefully be horizontal. So in conclusion, uh, low VM creation time is good. It gives us a nice, uh, nice paradigm for creating applications and carving up, uh, carving up hardware. Uh, and it's necessary for scaling, if you want to do your scaling at the VM level. VM creation time scales poorly due to software contention. Uh, in particular, uh, the libvert, uh, excuse me, so it, it scales poorly due to software contention. So one really nice way to look at this is that the bottlenecks in libvert uh, were actually very easily fixed. I only spent about a week fixing them. It took me a lot longer to do all the tracing and whatnot. So that's good. Uh, libvert, excuse me, OpenStack is a fairly clean architecture. Things are nicely isolated. There's a few global locks. Uh, libvert's still a big bottleneck, but it's, uh, you know, it's one bottleneck. And tracing is a nice technique to help identify uh, the contention. So the future work is through the RPC coalescing for the uh, conductor updates. To eliminate the big uh, QMU lock, as it's affectionately called in libvert circles. And then to do some more instrumentation, to look at other OpenStack services like Glance and Swift and Cinder, different quantum drivers, and see where the, uh, the bottlenecks are. And finally, to perform more experiments. So that's it. You're right. So the question is, it looks like the Python decorators were added manually to the code. How did you decide where to add them? Uh, so it was an iterative process. So I added them to the highest level uh, points, which was the RPC dispatching and the uh, HTTP request handler. Uh, so you saw these big bars that comprise the, the extent of the entire request, and then I just started to drill down. So Nova has a few common design patterns, like to have a manager and subclassing the manager. So actually, for that, I just used a, a meta class. And so then every method in the, that's implemented in any manager would be instrumented. Uh, and then locks, you know, just based on the intuition that there's probably contention there. But it was, it was kind of an iterative process. And once I got a detailed view and I figured out where the bottlenecks were, that, that was it. Yeah? One question. Um, have you ever attempted to use uh, Thread Tech uh, training loops, um, you know, sampling? Um, is, that, is that a good method? Uh, so I've used that in the past for other kind of performance measurement. Uh, I didn't consider that approach for this. And the reason, so the reason why one might choose to use tracing uh, as opposed to statistical sampling, that is where you periodically just take a look at where the stack trace is and then see uh, based on the frequency of the samples and a function and a, and a stack trace, that's where you're spending your time. Uh, you do this uh, because of overhead. Uh, so tracing every function call, you introduce some overhead. So with this method, it was about one millisecond per function call. But because Nova is doing things on a, as far as you know, software is concerned, kind of on a geological time scale, like there were only 800 function calls over the course of 100 seconds, uh, doing 800 one millisecond traces, uh, you know, it, there wasn't there wasn't a whole lot of overhead, and that's the that's the easiest kind of output to analyze.
Oh, absolutely. So the question is, at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that uh, quantum fixed some contention issues that were in Nova Network. Okay. So uh, Nova Network and uh, quantum uh, open v so Nova Network with the Linux bridges firewall implementation and quantum with the open v switch fire uh, the open v switch implementation both use Linux's IP tables to implement uh, the firewalls. So that hasn't changed. What has changed is that apparently uh, with quantum the updates to the IP tables are coalesced. Uh, so that say there's you know ten virtual machines being created and they all need their IP tables rules. Uh, in Nova Network, those 10 would happen in sequence due to, a, or they'd be serialized due to a global lock, and so 10 times a couple of seconds, that would add up. Uh, with quantum, they're, they're coalesced. And furthermore, the network creation in quantum happens asynchronously with the, uh, the rest of the VM creation. So those are just nice, uh, some nice improvements. Uh, absolutely. I think they'll be posted on the OpenStack Summit site, but I'll also post them. If you Google my name, I have a page from a long time ago when I was a student. Uh, I'll put them there. And the code, uh, the tracing code's available on, uh, on GitHub. I made some branches. Yeah? Or oh, maybe a new question. Yeah, uh, Okay, so the question is, uh, the observation was that this is on Grizzly, and the question is, uh, what does this change set look like on Folsom? Uh, I don't know. I did most of these what patches. The oh, the difference between the two was about 10 seconds. Just everything was shifted up by 10 seconds due to um, due to uh, due to quantum. There were other there were other things. Uh, there were, so the there there used to be a lot of eventlet and kind of libvirt blocking and database blocking problems in Essex a long time ago when I first looked at this, and the curve was way more horrible. But the the thread pool took care of a lot of that. But it, it's getting uh, consistently better, which is which is nice. Okay, thank you very much.